Hasn't the week been wonderful? It really has. Wonderful preaching all week long from uh, the first part of the week. I missed the early morning service by Dr. Schindler, and I missed most of uh, Brother Knickerbocker's Sunday school. But since then, I've been in every service. We've heard about the holiness of God. We've heard a message on uh, the walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, how to know you're being led by the Spirit all this week. Heard messages on going soul winning and how to go soul winning and the importance of going soul winning. Amen. Heard messages on how to save a country and how to kill the American dream. Amen. Heard messages all week long. I told Brother, uh, Brother Walton tonight, I, I stay every year with the, uh, Brother Bruce and Miss Pat Walton and uh, we have, uh, we've become very good friends over the years. And I told him the title of my message tonight, after all this wonderful music and the great choir numbers and the inspiring congregational singing and the incredible specials all week and all the preaching, I told him I was going to preach a message entitled, How to Ruin a Good Jubilee. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, well, last night you killed America and tonight y'all are going to kill the, dream, uh, the Jubilee. <laughs> and of course, I reminded him that we were just talking about killing the American dream in its modern sense. And I'm just telling you, if anybody wanted to kill the Jubilee, I'm going to tell you how to do it here in just a couple of minutes. If you're leaving here the same tonight as you were when you got here Sunday morning, it's not because you haven't heard the Word of God preached. It's not because you haven't, uh, the Holy Ghost hasn't done His job. If you're leaving here the same as you came when the meeting started, it's because you chose not to draw closer to the Lord. You chose not to be more like Him. You chose not to be more conformed to His image. And we end up on Thursday night every year. This is, I think, my tenth jubilee in a row. I'm not quite sure about that but I think it's my 10th Jubilee, maybe my 11th that I've been here. Every single year we end and we say, wow, that was a wonderful Jubilee. We always end on a big crescendo, always end with the big service, always end with the a great special and beautiful singing. And every single year we talk about how wonderful the Jubilee was. And it's true, and they have been, and you, everyone in the room would agree that we've, uh, we've had some incredible services over the years. But tonight I want to talk to you about uh, someone in the Word of God who won a great victory, not a victory that we typically talk about when we talk about this Bible character, and then immediately turned around and wasted it. Immediately took, instead of reveling in this victory, instead of continuing on to the completion of this victory, he'd won one battle, but instead of continuing on to, com to win the war, he decided to ruin the whole thing. And as a matter of fact, the sin that this man commits in this passage of Scripture, other than the great victory that we talked about the other night, it becomes his signature moment. Two things everyone remembers about David. Two things that every single Christian, you might not be able to tell me how long he reigned over Israel, how long he reigned over Judah. You might not be able to tell me the names of his brothers. You might not be able to tell me uh, all the victories he won. You might not be able to tell me any of those things, but you can tell me two things about David. Number one, he killed Goliath. And number two, he had an affair with Bathsheba. His second most defining moment, though, takes place at the end of a great victory. Now we heard a powerful message earlier this week on guarding our hearts from doc, uh, Dr. Knickerbocker and I'm not going in that direction tonight. But I want you to notice that King David is going to win a powerful, a great victory in, in 2 Samuel chapter 10. But before we get there, a little background. We'll preach this passage but we will make application to us today. David was anointed king over the, over the tribe first of Judah. And he did reign over Judah for seven and a half years. And then he was anointed over the twelve tribes. He's going to continue to rule for 33 years over the entire nation of Israel. And David proves to be as, as faithful and as true and as honest and as just and as wise as he has proven to be before he became king. He doesn't let it go to his head. He does not start acting differently as his son will do after he becomes king. But David continues to win victory and victory after victory. And in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, he goes to the Lord. The Philistines show up to fight him. And David, rather than just putting on his armor and going out to battle, he said, Lord, should I go up? And the Lord says, go up. 
David goes up and defeats the Philistines. Later in the same chapter, he defeats the Philistines a second time. You get to chapter 8, and you find him defeating the Philistines. Then he defeats the Moabites. Then he defeats a man by the name of Hadadezer. Takes 1,000 chariots from him. Kills 700 horsemen. And kills 20,000 footmen of Hadadezer's Syrian army in one battle. Then he turns around and defeats the Syrians a second time. Later in the same chapter, this time, 22,000 casualties of the Syrians are left on the battlefield. David has conquered and conquered and conquered and conquered. By the time you get to chapter 10, not only has he won all of these victories, but he's also turned around and found a member of King Saul's family for the sake of Jonathan that he can honor, that he can take care of, and he takes care of Mephibosheth. You also see David sitting there and he begins, and we'll talk about this passage here in just a few moments, as he's sitting there taking a rest in his house made of cedar, he said, wait a minute, I've got a house, but God doesn't. And David begins the process and starts saving money, although he's not allowed to build it, of making plans to build a temple for God. He's already had the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant brought, in, brought back in to Jerusalem where it belongs. David, there's no other term to describe him in the early part of his reign than this one simple word, successful. He is riding high, just like you and I on the last night of Jubilee. Look if you will please what the Bible says. He turns his attention, by the way, to try to be a diplomat. Second Samuel chapter 10, we'll begin reading in verse 1. And it came to pass after this, that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan the son of Nahash, and his, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his, for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father? That he hath sent these comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Now look up this way. In the next couple of verses, this man, uh, this, this king of the people of Ammon is going to embarrass and humiliate this State Department delegation that David has sent to the nation uh, of the Ammonites. And they're going to humiliate them. One thing they're going to do, they're going to shave half of their beards off and they're going to do other things that we won't take the time to read. And then David comes and he meets with them. And he says, listen, you guys go to Jericho and you wait there till your beards grow back. Then you can come back home because they were embarrassed and now David's not happy look down at verse 6 please if you will and when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David <laughs> that means David wasn't very happy was, was it with them was he they saw they stank before David the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of, uh, uh, of Bethrahab and the Syrians of Zebo, uh, Zobah, uh, 20,000 footmen, and the king, Maachai, 1,000 men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. That's a pretty big army right there that they've hired of mercenaries to help them. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. Now we won't read the entire battle, but jo uh, uh, Joab and his brother Abishai divide up their forces. And Joab basically says, if the Ammonites get too much for me, you come and help. If the Syrians get too much for you, then I'll come and help. But when the Syrians, the hired mob, if you will, the mercenaries, saw the nation of Israel, they fled. And all of a sudden the Ammonites are left by themselves. Now, I want you to skip down a few verses and watch what happens. Look, if you will, at chapter 10. We'll begin reading in verse 13. The Bible says, And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, then fled they also before Abishai, and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And had a razor sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river. And they came to Helam and Shabak, and, uh, Shobak, uh, uh, the captain of the host of Hadarezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40 
thousand horsemen and smote Shobak the captain of their host who died there and when all the kings that were servants to Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel they made peace with Israel and served them so the Syrians feared to help the children of Israel of Ammon anymore now watch this and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed who? The children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. How to ruin a good jubilee. How to ruin a nice winning streak, we could put it that way. David has been almost indefeatable. I mean, no one has been able to come up with enough soldiers to wipe out David. If you just do the math that we've read about so far, at least 100,000 casualties have come at the, at, the, uh, at the fighting of the children of Israel. And now instead of finishing the task, David is going to stay at home. David is not going to do what carries on the victory, uh, the victory streak that he's got going. I'll tell you something, Christian. Instead, because we do this, do we not? We look at the Jubilee and say, that's the highlight of our year. What if we looked at the Jubilee and said, that was a good start? Amen. What if we looked at the Jubilee and said, that got something going that never stopped? Amen. I'm going to show you tonight, though, how to ruin a good Jubilee. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time again in your house. Father, I pray that you'll bless the message this evening. Have your will and way in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, number one, that he's just finished with an unbelievable victory. An unbelievable victory. It's not just the children of Ammon, it's all of the Syrians. I, I think the number there was about 27,000 Syrians that joined the children of Ammon. Children of Ammon had baited David, if you will. They had really started this thing. They knocked the, knocked the chip off of David's shoulder, if you will. And now the battle is going to come to them and they know there's nothing they can do about it. So what they want to do is get this conspiracy going, this, this if you will, uh, these allies to come and make sure that they are so powerful that David wouldn't have a chance against them. That no matter how mad David is, he would be prudent enough to realize that the odds were insurmountable. I want you to know that there were great odds against them. The children of Israel, David, the Bible tells us a few verses uh, later, uh, I'm sorry, a few verses before, that David had assembled 30,000 men. It seems as if David is, David is going to be pretty well outnumbered here. The odds were stacked against them. You know, when you came to the, this Jubilee this year, and by the way, anytime you come to church, but we're focusing just on the Jubilee, the odds were stacked against you. I mean, you look around in the world today, and we look at a church like Capital Baptist Church, and we rejoice in what goes on here and how the Lord's Amen. blessed this church. But when you look at the city of Dover, Delaware, Capital Baptist Church makes up a pretty small minority, doesn't it? Right. Even your footprint, your, the, 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 your footprint of influence, even with the radio station and all of that, all the soul winning that goes on, all the visitation, the Christian school, all of those ministries, all of those buses that are out there, all the things that you're doing for the cause of Christ, it's a small minority of Dover, Delaware. But you came to church being in the small minority of Dover, Delaware, and you came to the Capital Baptist Church, and you decided that you were going to be one of those few people that ends up leaving here differently than you came. You determined that you were going to come here and you're going to spend the week and listen to the messages that are prepared and preached to you. You let the Holy Ghost work in your heart. You're going to draw closer to the Lord. You're not going to sit in your seat when the invitation is given. You're going to be a moldable and pliable servant to God. Now understand this. If you, a Capital Baptist Church is the minority of Delo Dover, Delaware, then those people are the minority of Capital Baptist Church. How small a group is it really? that truly on their way to church prays, Lord, please convict me. Lord, please, tonight, whatever I hear in the messages, I want you to apply it to my heart so that I leave differently than I came. Amen. Lord, please search me and see if there be some wicked way in me. We are so outnumbered, it's not even funny, are we? 
the Christians that truly want to see God do something great. And I, I pray that I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. I pray that I'm completely wrong. I pray that I'm preaching to an entire crowd and every single person in this room came to church tonight with your cup up, ready to be filled. You came to church tonight not with your own self-righteousness and your self-consciousness, but you came here ready to be convicted, ready to be changed, ready to be molded into the image of Christ. I pray that I'm, out, I'm completely wrong on that. That it's not the minority of this congregation. It's the majority of the congregation. Amen. But even if it is, we're still outnumbered, aren't we? Right. And the Christian that comes with that kind of heart, with that kind of desire, he has to face some enemies along the way. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who we fight against. Right. We fight against the prince and the power of the air. Bible, Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're per perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. The simple fact is, Christian, we are outnumbered. The Ammonites already outnumbered us, and now they've hired the Assyrians to fight against us too. This is an unbelievable victory. Notice, please, that the odds were against them, but secondly, please, the victory was completed. When the Assyrians flee, then David comes out and the Syrians decide to attack. These same Syrians who had fled just a little while before decided they were going to attack. And not only did David wipe out all of those that were supposed to come against him, those mercenaries, you'll notice the number that David defeats is almost double the number that came out to fight with the Ammonites. In other words, if the Ammonites and the Syrians had not fled, David would have defeated all of them too at the same time. What a victory. And now the Syrians say, all right, you Ammonites, I'm going to make peace with David. It made sense for them to make peace with David, didn't it? Amen. I'm going to make peace with David, and if you want to fight David, you're on your own. And they won't even stand with them anymore. What a victory. Isn't that the same victory we have? If you were that person that came, or that group of people that came and you wanted to be different and you wanted to change and you wanted to be more like Christ as this week went on and messages have spoken to your heart and you've been here for every message that you could be here for. And you're going to leave here differently than you came. That's a great victory, isn't it? Amen. I mean, we can relish in that, can't we? As God's people, can't we step back just a little bit and say, praise the Lord, I'm more like Christ than I was when we started this thing? Because greater is He that is in you Amen. than he that is in the world. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. That which is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Psalm 135 and verse 6 says this, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did He in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and all the deep places. Psalm 115 and verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He pleased. I love what He told the disciples in John 16, 33. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Amen. I have overcome the world. Amen. Listen, Christian. It's an amazing thing when we realize, because we don't always realize this. We spend so much time looking at those that are on the broad way that lead to destruction that we fail to look around at the, those that are on the narrow way that lead to life everlasting. And every now and then, just every now and then, we'll realize once again, afresh and anew, that our God is bigger than all that the world has put together. And we'll realize that drawing closer to Him is in and of itself its own reward. We don't draw closer to Him so we'll get another crown. We don't draw closer to Him so that He'll pour out His blessings on us. No, those are byproducts. We draw closer to Him just so we can draw closer to Him. Amen. Lewis, please, this is an unbelievable victory. David should be ready to go now and wipe out those Ammonites. Don't you think? I mean, here they are. They've humiliated his delegation. They've hired the mercenaries. David's destroyed the mercenaries. And now it's time to go get the Ammonites. Now it's time for them to rue the day that they ever touched David's men. Now it's time for David to flex his kingly muscle like he's done against the Philistines and the Moabites and the Syrians and everybody else throughout the course of his reign. And now it's the time when kings go forth to war. Notice number one, we saw an unbelievable victory. Number two, we see an unscheduled vacation. We see an unscheduled vacation. 
It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab. David doesn't go. David doesn't lead the armies. David sent Joab. This is an unscheduled vacation. Notice first thing about this, though, he was lax. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be in the battle. Kings went forth to war. David stayed at home. Kings went to battle. David took a nap. The king slept in tents in the fields. David slept in the palace. I'll tell you something, Christian. David, because he's not where he is supposed to be, one thing is certain. He will not see firsthand the victory if the victory is won over the Ammonites. It's an impossibility. David will hear it from servants. David will hear it from, uh, uh, from Joab maybe after the armies come back. He will not see firsthand what God can do when God flexes his muscle. He's not where he's supposed to be. Here's what happens after a week of meetings like this. You've been, to, you've been here, maybe some of you every day. Maybe some of you have been here for all five messages every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, here Monday night, all day Sunday morning, and then Sunday comes around, and you're going to decide to stay home Sunday night. You're going to not be where you're supposed to be. It's simple. Brother Fox actually mentioned the verse. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I know this is simple. I know this is not deep theologically. But understand this. You're supposed to be in church. Amen. You can't see God work in the New Testament church if you're not in the New Testament church. You wonder how people can one year be a part of the Jubilee and working in the kitchen staff and going on visitation on Wednesday and two or three years later they don't come to church and they have nothing to do with church? You know where it started? They stopped coming to church. I don't know if I told this story, but I know I told it to the preachers. I don't think I've told it here at the church. But we were walking out of a place called McAllister's Deli. It was me and my wife and my pastor, Kevin Broyhill, and his wife, Lori. And we'd gone out to lunch together. And as we walk out, a man comes walking up to Pastor Broyhill. He has a name tag hanging around his neck, a lanyard hanging around his neck. And it's turned around backwards so he cannot see the picture on it. And he walks up. He doesn't know me from Adam, thank goodness. But he walks up to Pastor Broyhill. He says, hey, Pastor. Pastor, and it was one of those moments, you've, you've seen things like this before, I could tell immediately that Pastor Broyhill had absolutely no idea under the sun who this man was. It was like, hey, you, how you doing, brother? And he's shaking his hand, and the, the guy says, well, he said, uh, Pastor, I used to come to your church, but I quit going there in 2011. He said, since then, I've had four heart attacks. He said, my wife left me and she took our children. I lost my job. I lost my house. About that time, that thing around his neck turned around and it was, a, it was an actual, what they call a panhandler's license for the city of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In other words, he had the license to beg. And he said, and I actually live in that van sitting right over there now. Now, my pastor had no idea what to say. It, it's a good thing. I'm not a pastor. I had no clue what to say. I know what I would have wanted to say. I'll tell you that in just a second. So my, 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 my pastor's standing there, and he, and he looks at him. He's trying to come up with something, and he, says, he actually says this. He says, other than that, is everything going okay? <laughs> other than that? What is there other than that? You lose your family, your job, your health, and all your money, and you lost your house. I mean, what's the guy supposed to say? Yeah, this belt looks good on me. <laughs> As an evangelist, you know what I wanted to say? I guess you shouldn't. I guess you should have just stayed in church, shouldn't you? Say, Brother Harper, would he still have his wife and he wouldn't have had those heart attacks? He'd still have his job and he'd still have his house. I can't tell you that if he'd have stayed in church. What I can tell you is he'd have had about 700 people praying for him every Amen. single Sunday. My own, my own family, my mom and dad. I, ra I was my, my younger brother and my, my two younger brothers were raised by the same parents in a completely different household. I was raised, our family was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I went to Christian school all of my life except sixth grade when, when dad was stationed in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and we had to go to the Dodd School there on, on post. 
I was raised in church every time the doors were open. Shortly after I went away to Bible college and my sister went away to Bible college, my mom and dad got out of church. Within a year after they got out of church, they were divorced. Within just a few months after that, they were both smoking, they were both drinking, and my brothers grew up in a completely different household than I did. But it all started when they quit going to church. I'm going to tell you something, Christian. It's not just some trite thing that we preach on because we want people in the pews. It's not just something we preach on because we know that the more people that are in church, the better the chance is that the offering will be good size. It's not something that we preach on just so we can put a number in the bulletin and pastor can go to pastor's fellowship and say, well, we had 400 in our church service. That's not why we preach on this. We preach on it because we know what happens when you walk away. David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was lax. Not only was he not where he's supposed to be, he wasn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> he's supposed to be leading the armies. He's supposed to be saying charge. He's supposed to be ordering people and devising strategies. David doesn't have a sword. He's got a pillow. Right. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. What are we supposed to be doing, preacher? The same things you hear preached every single time you come to church. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman thee not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Meditating on the word day and night, that thou mayest observe the according to all that is written therein. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. Or hiding God's word in your heart, that you might not sin against him. Psalm 119 and verse 11. Those simple things that every single Christian knows that they're supposed to do, but so few Christians do. You want to make sure you never lose right after you won a battle? You want to make sure that the Jubilee isn't the highlight of the year, but a good start that gets built upon? You want to make sure that the decisions you made this week last, and you don't have to make the same exact decisions a year from now at next year's Jubilee? Stay in church, stay in your Bible. Amen. Amen. Oh, Brother Harper, that is way too simple. Is it really? If it's that simple, then why doesn't every single Christian do it? If it's that easy, then why don't we have an entire congregation in every church in which I preach where everybody goes to church every time the doors are open and reads their Bible every single day? Why is it that the minority of Christians actually pick up their Bible on a daily basis? Pray. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 5, verse 17, Pray without ceasing. The Lord spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 18 and verse 1. First Chronicles 16 and 11, Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face continually over and over and over. The Bible says to do that. Brother Harper, this is just elementary stuff. You know, some of us probably need to graduate from elementary school. Amen. You want the decisions you made to last until next year? You want to end up to, uh, on Sunday night and say, what? Well, huh, I thought the Jubilee was over on Thursday. But we still had it on Sunday here at Capitol Amen. Baptist Church. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Brother Knickerbocker and Brother Beal and Brother, Brother Fox and Brother Schindler and myself, we didn't just show up with the power of God in our Jubilee folders. <laughs> Jubilee doesn't end when we walk out unless you let it end when we walk out. And you let it end by not being where you're supposed to be and by not doing what you're supposed to be doing. But not only was he lax that he, uh, that he wasn't where he was supposed to be, wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, he also wasn't going to finish the task. Again, it is a battle against the Ammonites. The Ammonites are the ones that go to David. The Ammonites are the ones that David sent Joab to destroy. And now the entire force of the Israeli army is going to rain down on the cities of the Ammonites. You would think that David would have wanted, wanted to have been there for that. But he says, I'll just stay here in the palace. I can trust Joab to do it for me. I can trust Abishai to do it for me. No, David, you're supposed to be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're supposed to finish the task. He was lax. Not only was he lax, I love this though, he was lazy. This is not the hallmark of the life of David, but you'll notice what it says, please. Look at verse 2 of chapter 11. And it came to pass in an evening tide. It does not say night. That means in the evening tide. That means five, six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Notice what it says. That David arose from off his bed. He's in bed at six in the evening. Huh. Say, Brother Harper, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you, David was lazy. 
David is taking a vacation that's not scheduled. David is taking a vacation to which he was not entitled. And he's just laying around doing nothing. He's not sitting at a drawing board looking at battle plans. You know, you see it all the time when, when, uh, when you see uh, documentaries and stuff. They've got those little, I don't know where they get them, those little miniature uh, army, army, army uh, battalions and stuff, and they're moving them around on the map, and everybody's, it's not what David's doing. David is just sitting around pacing the floor. I wonder how the battle went today. I mean, it's towards evening. I wonder when the messenger left. I wonder if he's going to get here. I wonder how the armies did today up against the walls. That's not what David's doing. It's even tied, and David's going. Ugh. He's lazy. By the way, Christian, let me just say this, and I don't mean to be ugly. There's just absolutely no room for laziness in the cause of Christ. Amen. Right. Notice, please, he was lax, he was lazy, he was looking. He goes walking along the rooftop, looking around. This is the same David that had written in Psalm 101 and verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. James warns us about it in James 1, 14 through 16, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Here's David walking along, looking around. He's not supposed to be looking around. I'm not going to give Bathsheba a pass because no one should have been in the palace. But as we heard this morning about Vashti, she could have easily said no to David just like the heathen woman Vashti did to the heathen king when he sent for her. David was lax, he was lazy, he was looking, and he was lusting. We're not going to preach on this passage of Scripture. We're not going to preach on what David and Bathsheba do. Again, the men all heard an incredible message on that earlier in the week. But if he had not, if he had been where he was supposed to be, he'd have never seen Bathsheba. Can I point this out too? And maybe I'm out on a limb here, but I believe that David has gotten so far away from the Lord, he's not where he's supposed to be, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, that if David had looked on the rooftop of that house and saw a jug of wine, he'd have gotten drunk. I believe David would have succumbed to any sin that he saw when he was up on top of that rooftop because he's not where he's supposed to be and he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. You know, think about this for just a moment. How many times have you heard of a Christian who is going to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, reading their Bible, praying every day, and going on soul winning that ended up leaving his wife? That's what I thought. It's always someone who stopped those things. It's always someone who shirked his responsibilities just like David. This is an unscheduled vacation. He was lax, he was lusting, he was looking, and he was lustful. You say, Brother Harper, it sounds like you don't ever want us to take a break. <laughs> David should have just been out in the battlefield. I, think, I don't think there's any argument about that. Everyone would agree with that. But then, then the question comes, well, Brother Harper, can't we take a break? It's funny you ask that because go back to chapter 7 of the same book, please. I want you to see something. There is absolutely nothing wrong with resting. There is something wrong with quitting. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Watch what it says here, please. And it came to pass... When the king sat in his house, watch it, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Amen. That the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, do, do, go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. I want you to understand something, please. Listen to this. There's a difference between resting after a task is finished and quitting. Quitting is when we think of ourselves. Resting makes us think about God. Quitting causes us to be selfish. Resting causes us to be spiritual. Quitting causes us to talk about sin. Resting causes us to talk about worship. Quitting makes us prideful. Resting makes us ponder. Quitting is when we put our needs above the job. Resting is when we put the job into perspective. Quitting is forbidden. Resting is promised. The land of Canaan was a land of rest for the children of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old past, where is the, God, uh, the, God, uh, the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Yes. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest for your souls. Rest is prescribed. Rest is necessary. Sometimes we get tired and we have to get away. But I'm here to tell you something. Rest does not trump what God has called us to do. Amen. You don't take a rest from being a Christian when you need to relax a little bit. You don't take a rest from God's house when God gives you rest. David is sitting there resting the rest that God has given him. And what does he say? He doesn't say, boy, I think I'll walk along the roof and see if I can see anything interesting. He's not waking up in the middle of the evening when he's got some rest from Almighty God. As he's resting, he's thinking, you know what? We need to build a real house for the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. Notice the difference between rest and quitting. And Christian, the decisions that you made this week, not one preacher on this platform, not one preacher that stood behind this pulpit this week can make you keep them. Not one. You have to just decide you're going to be where you're supposed to be and you're going to do what you're supposed to do. Notice, please, number one. We saw there was an unbelievable victory. Number two, we saw an unscheduled vacation. But number three, watch this. Remember, this is the same man. Let me just hearken you back to a couple of nights ago. This is the same man that stood in that valley and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath. Yeah. Yeah. Notice, please, skip down a few verses. You know the story. We're not going to recount, re 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 rehearse the entire story, but Uriah the Hittite is now dead at the ordering of David himself. Now, I want you to notice what happens, please, as you skip down to verses 22 through 25 of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. The messenger has been sent by Joab to tell David how the battle is gone, and the battle has not gone well. Remember when David went out to fight the Syrians, how well the battle went? David's not there. The battle's not going well. Look at verse 22. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even unto the evening of the gate. Entering of the gate. Now wait just a second. What should have been the response of David right now? The David of chapter 5, the David of chapter 7, the David of chapter 10. David would have said, strap on my armor. This is not going the way it's supposed to be going. I need to get to the battlefield. I need to get there and lead my men. We've got to fix this. This is wrong. We've got to change some things. We've got to take the battle to them instead of having them take the battle to us. They were attacking the city. And not only had they been driven back from the walls of the city, the people of Ammon had become so brazen and so bold, they opened the gates of their city and attacked them at the gate of their own city. Instead of sitting in, in their defensive position against Israel, they're attacking! That's not what's supposed to happen. Right. David should have been furious. He at least should have been moved. His first question should have been, how many men did we lose? How many people died today? Is Joab okay? How about Abishai? Shouldn't that have been what he asked? But I want you to notice how uncaring this man's vision is now. Look what it says, please, verse 24. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Here's the response from David. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. For the sword devoureth one as well as another. There's an old saying that was used a lot uh, back before my time, but I've heard it. Que sera, sera. No big deal. Somebody has to die. It is war. Notice what he says, please. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. <laughs> that doesn't sound like the David we know, does it? It doesn't sound like the David that says, after I kill Goliath, I'm coming to get you guys too. That doesn't sound like the David that they sang when he came in after behaving himself wisely and coming in and out in front of the people. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. You hear no concern whatsoever. You hear no compassion whatsoever. I want you to notice three things quickly, please, about this uncaring vision. First off, he was concerned only with himself. He does not care about the Lord. He does not care about the armies. He does not care about Joab. By the way, he does not care about Bathsheba. 
makes you realize that old Ammon, Amnon, his son, that's going to rape his sister Tamar and then kick her out of the room, that Amnon is just acting just like his daddy. He's a chip off the old block, if you will. David doesn't say, oh no, I know I wanted Uriah dead. I know it needed to, I needed to cover that for the sake of no one knowing about my sin, but I, I feel sorry at least for Bathsheba that she's lost her husband. There's no concern. There's no care for anybody but David. I'm here to tell you something. You ever noticed how people when they get out of church, they don't care about church anymore? They don't care about the people at church. They don't care about what's happening here. They don't care about the calls of Christ. They don't even get excited when they hear what's happened at church. That's exactly what's happened to David. He was concerned with himself. He was convinced his sin was hidden. <laughs> Your eye is dead. Problem solved. We know what's going to happen in the next chapter, but just like every single child of God, David should have realized, as Moses had warned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, be sure your sin will find you out. As Paul will one day tell the Galatians, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Or Isaiah 59 and verse 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as, as for our iniquities, we know them. David is now convinced that he's gotten by with it. No more problem. Uriah is dead now. He's going to take Bathsheba to be his wife. And don't you hate his cavalier attitude about the death of his servants? Oh, well, somebody had to die. Ah, today we'll win some, lose some. What a terrible attitude. It doesn't faze him to know that the battle is over and that his armies have lost. Listen, Christian, we can't help but end on a high note, can we? I mean, after a week of having the Word of God preached, you want to know why you end up a better Christian at the end of Jubilee than you do even at the end of a revival? Because of the preaching. I'm not saying because of the preachers. I'm saying because of the preaching. Because if you were here in the mornings and the evenings, do you realize how many messages you heard this week? How many times someone stood in a pulpit and said, Thus saith the Lord, open up your Bibles? How many times someone expounded a passage of Scripture this week? I'm here to tell you something. You can doubt it all you want, but the proof is in the pudding, as they say. The more times you're under the preaching of the Word of God, the more, uh, the more closely you're going to walk Christ, and the more you're going to want to emulate the calls of Christ. Amen. What I'm saying is, the reason that Jubilee is the highlight of the year is because you heard more preaching this week than you hear any other week of the year. You opened your Bible more times this week than you will any other time of the year. You were in prayer meetings every single morning, as all the men gathered around the platform before we started. Prayer has been going on all week long. Your heart was not saturated by the music that you usually listen to. It was saturated by this choir and my special music that was all week. And you lifted up your voice and you sang the praises to Almighty God right from a hymnal from Christ honoring words written by men that love the Lord. And you're going to leave here better than you were when you came. It always works that way. And the problem is, starting tomorrow, it's over. That's how you ruin a good jubilee. But if tomorrow you wake up, and I'm not suggesting you sit all day in your house and go from sermon on YouTube to sermon on YouTube to sermon on YouTube. I'm not suggesting you have to have five messages a day to stay right with God. What I am saying is, if you open your Bible tomorrow, and you read it tomorrow, and you study it tomorrow, and you meditate on it tomorrow, and you get alone with Almighty God, as we heard a message on prayer earlier, uh, earlier today that was so powerful. You get alone with Almighty God, and you seek His face, and you seek the will of Almighty God by following the leading of the Holy Spirit in every area of your life, and you determine that this is not just the best week of the year. This is the normal week of the year. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And you start looking forward to September when Brother Comfort comes to preach a revival. And you start looking forward to missions conference. And you start circling dates on your calendar when you're going soul winning. And you start looking forward to next year's Jubilee. And next year's Jubilee, you start where you finish this one. 
And Brother Harper, that's not possible. No? Not if you stay at home when everybody else right. goes to battle. Yeah. Not if you're not where you're supposed to be. Right. And not if you're not doing what you're supposed Amen. to be doing. Right. People will say this, well, I wish we could have Jubilee every week of the year. <laughs> well, you can. Right. Because the secret, the power behind Jubilee is right here. The songs that you heard sing, sung this week, you can listen to them all day long. But you're going to go back to the same music that you would have normally listened to in the evenings starting next week. You go back to your Bible sitting on the end table where it's always been sitting. And then in three or four weeks, you'll look back wistfully on what a great jubilee we had. And you'll say, boy, I sure wish we could have that all year long. <laughs> It would be a sad thing, wouldn't it, Brother Fox, if Jubilee left when we pack up and go home? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if Jubilee left? Because you're not singing, I sing the mighty power of God before every service. That would be a tragic thing. But the only thing that can possibly stop you from having Jubilee in your heart every day is you. Be where you're supposed to be. Amen. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Amen. Brother Harper, that's just all simple stuff. I tell you something. If it's so simple, well, let's just all do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And if you'll, if you'll do that, Amen. Jubilee won't be the highlight of the year. It'll be a great start. Amen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around.